this talk today, XBMC and making an open media system, and particularly making an open media system using the Raspberry Pi. Uh, I'm going to be doing the first part of the talk, and then Lucas Mosolin is going to be doing the second part of the talk, which is going to be a demonstration of the capabilities. So you can see the type of performance that the Raspberry Pi gives, and you can see the types of things you can do with it using different types of peripherals. And pardon me while I get used to this thing because I'm not used to it. So first of all, what is a media center? A media center is basically the combination of some type of operating system, whether it be Windows or OS X or Linux or BSD or any of one of the others. But on top of that, you put software which can manage your pictures, your music, your video, your movies, maybe out, reach out across the internet to get things like a weather report, do voice over IP for a telephone, that type of thing. So that's what a media center is. Now, why have a media center? I have a friend of mine, Douglas Conrad, who runs a company in Florinopolis called OpenS. Douglas has two small children. He goes to the video store, he gets a couple DVDs. Each child wants to watch the DVD that he selected for them at the same time. So Douglas either has to have two DVD players, two full computer systems to watch it, or else he puts the DVD into his media center. So he loads both DVDs into the media center so that each child can actually watch a different movie at the same time in their own room. Another thing that happens with DVDs is that they get, they, you get them, the child takes them, puts them in their room. Two or three days later, you find the DVD itself on the ground, scratched, broken, and useless. With a media center, you load the DVD in, and then you record it, you copy it, and then you put it up on the shelf so that no longer uh, is it open to the children to have it scratched. It also allows you to have parental control. You can put movies on there which are for adults, and you can uh, only let adults see them, or you can have movies on there for children and let the children see them. So you get to have some control over what your children see. You can also share an internet connection. The media center can be the source of where your internet comes in, and you can also be a kind of a wireless router to share the information to all of your computer systems in your house. And finally, you can record TV shows for later. This type of thing that happens with a TiVo, where you say, I like to watch this show, but I don't have time to watch it while it's being broadcast. I want to record it later, for watching later, and you can watch it. So these are all the different types of things that a media center can do that you, know, you normally wouldn't have up until a few years ago. But what is an open media center? You'll see advertisements for Sony or Hitachi or LG, and they'll sell you this big TV set. And they'll tell you that you can store, you can hook up this to it, and you can store data on it. Or they'll tell you that you can access the internet with it. Or you can t they'll tell you that you can do all sorts of things. But the problem is, the TV is hooked to, if it's a Sony TV, it's hooked to a Sony amplifier. And it's hooked to Sony speakers. And if you try and substitute an amplifier from a different company, it doesn't necessarily work with a Sony TV. So another problem is that these manufacturers typically lose interest in their TV about three days after you purchased it. So the next TV that comes out has all these new features, but you can't necessarily get them for your old TV. Or you have a bug in it. Remember, this TV is now connected to the Internet. And anything that's connected to the Internet is under constant attack. So you may not necessarily be able to get upgrades to your TV from Sony to protect you from these attacks. 
you might be able to put your TV behind a firewall, but most, you know, most mothers and fathers can't do that type of thing. And it has longevity. An open system, you can continue to have it open and you can continue to upgrade it as long as you want to. You're not necessarily tied to the fact that your warranty has run out and the vendor is no longer going to upgrade your TV for free. So here are some examples. We want to start off with a very, very simple system. So you have a regular monitor, some you know, stereo speakers that are amplified to give you a little bit louder sound, and then a keyboard and a mouse to control it. And that could be a very simple media system if you had a computer to store your data and to do the processing and switching and everything else. But if you took and added just a few things to it, maybe you add a subwoofer and that gives you some more bass. Maybe you upgrade to a higher resolution TV. You should not have to throw away the computational part of your system just because you're upgrading these things. Then you go to a high end where you have a combination keyboard mouse to save you some ports. You have an eight channel amplifier, so you have 7.1 surround sound. You go to a high definition TV. Uh, you may have a wireless router built in, so you don't need the wireless router anymore in your house. And you, you leave your TV on all the time, or you leave your media center on all the time because it's doing this wireless routing for you. It could also become your security system. It could become your home automation center. This one media center box is now doing lots of things and you never turn it off. And if you never turn it off, you want it to be as low power as humanly possible. So it uses a small amount of electricity, not 250 watts or 350 watts, just enough electricity to do all the things that you want your home, your home media center to do. And in the United States, we have this term, honking. Honking means it's really great. And so you upgrade your system even more. You have a giant monitor, or maybe you have a projection TV, or you, have, you use an LCD projector to project the image on the wall. You go to an eight channel amplifier or even a 10 channel amplifier and you have 250 watts or 1,000 watts or 2,000 watts to the amplifier. You store your, your, your local storage for your disks, your music, and your pictures, but you can also reach out across the internet for network storage and store some of this in the cloud. You take a system like this that you started off with and you duplicate it in places like your bedrooms or maybe you have one on your patio or out by your swimming pool. And all of them are still receiving the resources of the one media center which is in your system. And you haven't had to throw away anything. You can keep everything that you bought and upgrade along the way. And the last, of course, what you need in a honking computer system like this is good beer and good wine and good scotch. Okay, that makes the perfect media center. So let's take a look at what XBMC does for you. XBMC is the layered software. It is open source. It is developed by a large team of people who are media experts. They're audio experts. They're video experts. And they're developing this software to create this media center. Sure, they look at other media centers and say, hey, that's a great idea. We can do that too. But they can incorporate all the good ideas from different media centers into XBMC. It's cross-platform. For those of you in the audience who are not using the right operating system, but instead are using Windows or XOS, you can run XBMC on top of your platform too. And of course, it runs on every distribution of Linux. Now, what can you get from XBMC? You can get the weather forecast. You can then set up three different cities 
that you can get the weather forecast for. So I have mine set up for Amherst, New Hampshire, where I live, Florinopolis, New, uh, Brazil, that I would like to live, and Sao Paulo, Brazil, that I'm forced to be here. Okay, don't get nothing against the Sao Paulo people, but hey, you know, I'd rather be in Florinopolis. <laughs> you have either local or network storage for your movies, your videos, your, your music, and your pictures. Now, there's three or four different distributions just for the Raspberry Pi. There's one called Open Elect. Now, Open Elect is a nice distribution because you pull down the image of the distribution, you put it on an SD card, you plug it in, and you're all set to tune it to your particular needs. Very simple to do. If you, if you don't have a great amount of, of internet capacity, it might be the one you want to go with. Because once you've made your SD card, you can duplicate it over and over and over again. Remember, this is not proprietary software. If you make your SD card and get it set up exactly the way you want, you can make them for all your friends and give them away. It's okay. The next one is RAS BMC. That's the one you're going to see demonstrated today. They use a different style of installation. You pull down just enough to get it started, and then it pulls down the rest of the information off of the net and upgrades it. So this is something, if you have a little faster internet connection, you might want to be able to do this because it's always getting the latest and greatest from all of the repositories. XBN is yet another distribution created by another team. Now, why would you want to use one or the other? Sometimes one of them hasn't been updated for a while, and the XBMC code has been updated. So you might want to check and see which one is the most up-to-date. Recently, XBMC went from version 11 to version 12, and they added a lot of new features. So some of these distributions were lagging behind a little bit in putting the latest and greatest XBMC code into their, distribu their distribution. But now, version 12 is the official release distribution, and by the time you get home, all of these will have been updated to reflect version 12 of XBMC. And you'll see what XBMC version 12 gets you a little bit later. And finally, the last one is if you want to roll your own, if you want to make some changes along the way, you can install, install the base version of Linux for the, app, for the Raspberry Pi called Raspbian. It's actually a Debian distribution that's been tailored for the Raspberry Pi. And then you can build XBMC on top of Raspbian yourself and change it as you go along. All of the source code is available. So where do you start planning? Now, I've been looking at this for a long time because we're working with this type of thing for Project Kawa. We would like to offer this as a, as a product for people like you to sell in Project Kawa and for you to make money. So I've been going to different manufacturers inside of Brazil and saying, We'd like to use your speaker systems. We'd like to use your amplification system. We'd like to use your computer system, keyboards, and mice. But believe it or not, it isn't easy just picking out a set of speakers that would work nicely. Because the set of speakers, a lot of times, are meant to hook up to a receiver like made by Sony or a receiver made by Panasonic. And the prices of these things are very expensive compared to other countries. So what we want to do is give the people several choices in price lines, but again, always upgradable, always moving up. So the Raspberry Pi can actually do audio two different ways. One way is coming through the HDMI interface on the Raspberry Pi where you get eight channels 
of audio coming through in digital form. And the other way is analog in a 3.5 millimeter jack that comes out of the Raspberry Pi and you can plug what most people think of as PC speakers into them. Now PC speakers have changed a lot since I was in college. In fact, we didn't have PCs in college, so they've changed a lot anyway. But you can actually get a fairly decent set of PC speakers that have 250 watts of power, which would make your, everybody in your family tell you, keep turning down the sound, okay? But what you want is you want a set of speakers or an amplifier that has no controls on it. You don't want the amplifier changing your sound. You don't want to have another remote for your amplifier when you have a remote for your media center and then a remote for your TV and then a remote for your speakers. You know, this creates remote hell. So you want a simple amplifier that only amplifies and allow the sound to be produced by the by the uh, the PC itself or the computer itself. Unfortunately, with a 3.5 inch jack and audio, the only thing that comes out of that is stereo, two channels. If you want to create 2.1 channels, or 5.1 channels, or 7.1 channels, the only way you can do that is through the sound processor being in the amplifier or in the speaker set. So this speaker set has a sound processor in it that will take stereo and create what is known as 3D sound. It's a simulation of surround sound, but it's only a simulation because you only have two speakers. There's another speaker set that has five speakers and a subwoofer. And it also can use a stereo jack, two channels. It simulates the other six channels. So you have to decide which set of speakers you want and how you want to run your amplifier and your speaker system. So that's the second bullet you should build for your needs. If you have a small apartment, or if you're in a dorm room, maybe you don't have 750 watts of power in your amplification system. Instead, get a nice set of earphones that you can have 5.1 sound in your earphones. And as I said, make sure that each component does its job really well. Don't try and mix across component levels what they're doing because you'll run into the frustration of having to balance all of your remotes. Okay. So